Good afternoon. This will be a, a short update today. And as I was walking in here, I thought, I wonder if people are getting tired of these updates um, and, and uh, tired of, of, of hearing the information. But yet I think it is still important that we do do give you updates and make sure that people are informed about what's going on here in Prince Edward Island. And, uh, and as long as people are not tired of it, we'll continue. Sometimes I'm worried I'm going to get tired myself of, uh, of, uh, of trying to figure out what to wear. But uh, um, I do think it's really important that we continue to message out um, during this time and um, I hope uh, you agree. Around the world, there are close to 2 million cases of COVID-19 and 128,000 deaths. Across Canada, there have been over 27,000 cases and 903 deaths. Our case fatality rate in the country is 3.1%. 5% of the cases have been in young people less than 19 years of age. Today, I am confirming a new positive case for Prince Edward Island, bringing our total number of confirmed positive cases to 26, of which 23 are recovered. The new case is a male in his 30s from Queens County, an essential worker not providing public-facing service, returning from international travel. I spoke to him this morning. He is at home and his close contacts are being tested this afternoon. He has not been back to work since his return to the province. We also received an additional 92 negative test results since yesterday, and PEI has done more than 2,000 tests. Yesterday, I spoke about Prince Edward Island's model-based projections, which show what outcomes could look like with different public health interventions in place. Models are not perfect, and they do not tell the future. However, they do paint a picture of what could be and helping to inform planning and support decision making. The large majority of Islanders have been doing a tremendous job following the public health measures we've put in place. And these models show what PI might look like if these measures were not in place or were not being followed. While this is not the finish line, it is a sign that we are on the right track. So this is good news. It means our actions have made a difference, but we need to keep going. Our public health measures must continue. Staying home as much as possible, physical distancing, self-isolation following travel outside the province. If Islanders continue to adhere to public health advice, we may be able to look towards a time when an ease back plan can be implemented. And when it is time for this, it will be a delicate balance between modifying the measures and ensuring we will not overwhelm our healthcare system. However, it is not time to ease back yet, so we need to keep going. Some of you may have heard the Director General of the WHO who gave advice last night uh, to countries about what needs to be in place before easing up and reopening. And I think we need to look at some of those measures as even as a province as we uh, think about our easing up of these measures. I got home in time last night to uh, put my children to bed and they asked me the questions they often do. When can we see our friends? When can we start to do things? We used to do things, Mama. When can we start to do them again? When can we hug Gran? And aren't these the questions we are all asking? I wish I had answers for my children, and I wish I had answers to these questions for all Islanders. While I know we've been very fortunate to have had so few cases, my concern is always that Islanders will become complacent and we can ease up too quickly on the measures we've put in place. I do feel we need to stay the course, and this is difficult for everyone, but we should be really proud of what we have accomplished so far. I am proud of Islanders. And each day we comply with these measures and adhere to them 
is one day closer to living and working together more closely. Thank you. Aujourd'hui, autour du monde, nous voyons l'impact de COVID-19. Plus de 2 millions de cas et plus de 128 000 morts. À travers notre pays, il y a plus de 27 000 cas et plus de 900 morts. Il y a un nouveau cas ici à l'île du Prince-Édouard aujourd'hui. Notre total est rendu à 26, 26 et 23 sont rétablis. Je confirme également que nous avons reçu 92 résultats négatifs. C'est un homme dans ses trentaines de la comté de Queens. C'est un travailleur essentiel qui est revenu d'un voyage à l'étranger. Hier, j'ai discuté les projections pour notre province et ce qui aurait pu être notre situation si nous n'avions pas pris les mesures actuelles. Les modèles ne sont pas parfaits. Ce n'est pas une indication claire de l'avenir. C'est un portrait de ce qui est possible. C'est pour nous aider avec la planification et pour prendre les décisions. À tous les insulaires qui respectent les consignes, bravo et merci. Vous le faites avec brio. Selon le modèle, je vous ai montré ce qui pourrait être notre avenir si nous ne respectons pas les consignes. On n'est pas encore sorti de l'auberge, mais nous sommes sur la bonne voie. Je veux être clair, les actions que nous faisons aujourd'hui font toute la différence et c'est une bonne nouvelle chaque jour que je vous annonce que nous n'avons pas beaucoup de cas. Mais nous sommes loin d'arriver à la fin. On doit continuer à faire ce qui est nécessaire, rester chez nous, pratiquer la distance physique, l'isolement aux besoins quand vous venez de l'extérieur de la province. Si tout le monde continue à respecter les consignes, nous pourrions envisager un relâchement éventuel. C'est très délicat. Il va, il va falloir trouver un juste équilibre entre modifier les consignes et gérer les besoins de notre système de santé. Mais je vous confirme que ce n'est pas le temps de parler de relâchement, en, en tout cas. Concentrons-nous sur, sur les mesures pour protéger la santé et la sécurité de nos gens. On doit continuer. Ne cherchez pas des façons d'échapper aux consignes. Soyons fiers de ce que nous avons accompli. Je sais que je suis fière euh, de tous les insulaires. Je sais que c'est dur pour tout le monde. Si on continue à bien faire notre job, on serait en mesure de retourner à la norme plus rapidement. Merci. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Thank you once again to Islanders who are staying home and helping stop the spread of coronavirus. Health PEI continues to offer services needed for the health and safety of Islanders. However, we do remain on essential services, our essential services plan, which means services that can safely be put on hold will be rescheduled. We know this is difficult for everyone. It's difficult for patients and families who are waiting for important services and we cannot provide those right now. It's difficult for the staff and physicians who want to provide those services. However, we're not yet at a point where we can relax our preparedness and increase services. As Dr. Morrison has said, we need to maintain the good work we have done to limit the virus spread on PEI or risk losing any headway we have made. Part of our response, though, is to plan for the eventual reinstatement of services we have suspended. And we have a section dedicated at looking ahead at this to ensure all pieces of that puzzle are considered first, so no one piece will impact the others as we move forward. At Health PEI, we have also worked with our partners at the Public Health, Chief Public Health Office and our private long-term care homes to prepare and ensure those homes have plans to care for patients to protect them from the virus. The current plans include how we would isolate and care for any residents that were identified um, as potential or possible cases in long-term care homes. 
We continue to enforce our no visitation within these homes, and this protection was put in place early in our response, and it's important that it be maintained. We're working in every way possible to protect those vulnerable islanders. Our virtual care services, many of you have heard, are rolling out across the province this week, and we have more than 30 health care providers, including physicians and mental health practitioners, who are registered now to use this system. This system allows uh, secure video conferencing between health care providers and patients, and it also maintains the physical distancing and the security for the private information for those individuals. I'm also happy to report that yesterday we received 10 ventilators from the National Emergency Strategic Stockpile, and this is in addition to our current uh, supply of 19 ventilators that we have on hand, and in addition to the other 12 that are on order from our vendor, and the additional order of 15 that we have put through the federal uh, purchase process. In normal times, though, we, we usually have four to five times the number of ventilators needed for patient care on standby in case of emergency. With these additional ventilators, it provides us some significant increase in that capacity, but our threshold is low, and as the modeling showed yesterday, we are overall a small system that it does not take much for us to become overwhelmed if we are to have an outbreak on PEI. We still remain concerned and monitoring daily our supplies of medications and personal protective equipment, as well as all of the other supplies necessary for the care and treatment of patients if we were to have increased um, hospitalizations or the critical care needs for these type of patients. We're working with our staff and physicians across the health system to ensure everyone knows how to use the supplies and the right personal protective equipment in the right way. And, and to try and secure this equipment for the future. Our cough and fever clinics uh, and drive through testing clinics in Charlottetown and Summerside continue seven days a week. And yesterday we had 83 patients seen in Charlottetown and fit 37 at our Summerside clinic. I want to thank you once again for uh, everyone for doing their part in this response. And that includes the partners to our health system our public health and primary care staff and physicians who have stepped up to run the clinics, and all islanders who continue to follow the guidance under the public health emergency and stay home and only come out for essential services. Thank you. Thank you, Marion, and uh, happy to take some questions. Nicole Williams, CBC. Uh, hi there. My question is for uh, Dr. So I believe this is the first uh, case of COVID-19 that's an essential worker. Wondering what else you can tell us about this person and if they self-isolated upon returning from travel. Yes, so, um, and I think uh, we mentioned um, essential worker because I think it's, um, it may explain why there is still return uh, and from travel, um, at uh, international travel, um, the person returned uh, near the end of March. And um, so, um, I mean, I'm not sure w uh, what more I can say about the essential worker uh, and that, uh, but they're not public facing and they did not uh, go to work on return uh, to uh, uh, the province. Um, either inside the province or outside the province. And um, the close contacts that we mentioned would be really direct family, um, family connections uh, um, to this uh, case. So just to clarify before my next question, this mm -hmm. isn't a healthcare worker? It is not a healthcare worker. Okay, thank you. Uh, and I'm wondering if also you're considering starting to test, you know, now that we do have an essential worker with a, a, a pot that's positive, I'm wondering if you're starting to uh, consider testing all non essential or all essential workers or anyone coming here from out of province, even if they're not showing symptoms. Mm -hmm. So it's a really good question, and I have a meeting later on uh, today to discuss further plans around testing. 
The issue with testing is that um, if you're testing people who do not have symptoms, the test uh, has um, a false negative rate, meaning that it's uh, not as sensitive uh, if people do not have symptoms, and it would not. Uh, it would only be for that point in time. So, it's. Uh, for instance, I have been asked. Uh, you know, why aren't you testing everybody comes off the bridge? Well, it it would really be in many days later coming off the bridge that someone is more likely to have symptoms. And uh, if they have a test that's negative and maybe only 50% uh, or 60% sensitive um, on the first test, they may think that they can walk around um, thinking they have a negative test, um, which is not the case, and they may develop symptoms um, in, in the days that follow. Having said that, we are certainly are wanting to think about testing uh, what that looks like in terms of testing asymptomatic healthcare workers and residents in long-term care facilities if uh, there's a case there. So that is... Um, part of, of uh, our, the guidance and the and discussion uh, as we go forward. And the other uh, place where we would do testing of asymptomatic patients or people who don't have symptoms would be contacts of a case, um, even up to 48 hours prior to um, the case having symptoms. And uh, we have had that in place as well. So it's, um, it's an ongoing discussion about testing uh, for sure, Nicole. Uh, and we'll continue to do that. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Donna, CBC. Hello, thank you. I think this question is perhaps for Ms. Dowling. You mentioned the long-term care facilities. Are you looking at putting any further safety measures into the facilities given the scenarios right across the country? And more specifically, are you looking at potentially preventing workers from going from one facility and working in another facility? Yeah. Hi, Donna. Yes, we are, uh, is the answer to that question. We're, we have been watching um, the impacts on long-term care homes across the world and um, across Canada for sure. And that group of individuals in that age range or those those individuals who need to live in that type of an environment are extremely vulnerable with this virus. And so we're looking to put as many protections as we can in place, which is why I mentioned the early um, really response of limiting visitors. So now we're very aware that the only people coming in and out of those homes are our employees and our staff or the staff in a private home. So we're really looking carefully at what the impact would be around staffing and how we can support all the facilities, both the public within Health PEI or the private facilities across the province to make sure they have the staff in place to maintain services and the high standard of service that they want to provide to those islanders, as well as looking at um, providing masks and other pr protection measures so that our staff would not be bringing anything into the home if they happen to get exposed in the community. So there's a number of things that we're looking at and we have already uh, asked that homes take a look at avoiding the cross uh, staffing of uh, their individual staff within a home through households within that long-term care facility and other things, but we really need to look at considering the impact and make sure we have staff in place and supplies in place to support those, uh, those other protections. But you're not saying they can't work in different facilities at this point? We have not said that uh, as of this point, no. Okay. Um, on another, my other question would be regarding uh, the uh, ferry uh, crossing. Uh, for Dr. Morrison, I believe. Um, are you looking at putting in place the same kinds of testing, or not testing, but screening on either side of the ferry that currently exists on either side of the bridge? So, yes. So, um, and we actually uh, are 
trying to make sure we have a call with my counterpart in Nova Scotia and uh, the Northumberland Ferries uh, later in the week. Um, but that uh, for further discussion uh, regarding the Northumberland Ferries. And uh, but certainly at this point, it would be um, very similar uh, to the point of entry at, at Borden. Essential travel people yes. who are traveling essentially. Yes. That, that is the intention at this time. Thank you. You're welcome. Allison Jenkins, The Guardian. Yes, hello. Hi, Allison. Um, my question is about um, the closure of the, uh, the Lookout Inn in New Glasgow. It was recently told to stop quarantining out of province travelers by the public health officials at um, Health and Wellness. Why were the owners of the inns told to stop quarantining travelers? Um, so I, I don't have all the details in, in front of me, but, uh, and certainly happy to provide some of what we can, uh, to you, uh, after there were, um, issues, uh, my understanding issues around, um, the, how it was being promoted, uh, and how it was uh, being run. But, um, again, I can, um, I'm aware of it, uh, but I can certainly, uh, provide further details, uh, after, after the briefing. Okay. Thank you. Um, so my follow-up question, um, is, is about, um, how, how the public staff um, I understand there were some complaints received, and so my question is how the public health staff determine which complaints are legitimate and credible. So that, that's... And how that, yeah. So um, the, we have um, had 156 complaints uh, in to uh, our office uh, that have been referred on to enforcement, and then some came in through police referrals and some through Crime Stoppers. Um, and... There are certainly some complaints that come in and uh, some people uh, do not want to leave uh, any their name or any details. So those are difficult uh, to follow, obviously. Um, some uh, are uh, around having seen someone who um, is not physical distancing, but by the time uh, anyone would have... Uh, would get there, um, difficult to, um, to do anything and really, uh, difficult to enforce. So the complaints, um, are, that are about, uh, particularly about self-isolation. And so it, um, can be followed up in various ways. Uh, we have the names of people who are coming across the bridge or at the airport. Um, so we, uh, can, uh, the enforcement can reference when they actually arrived on um, Prince Edward Island and if they need to be self-isolating. Uh, I think that's sort of the, what you were asking. Uh, uh, there's 70 warnings that enforcement has issued, um, 127 residences that have been ten, uh, attended by uh, enforcement, and, um, and then a, a smaller number of charges that have been laid. Um, just to follow up on the residences that got visited, did the Lookout Inn get visited by these enforcement uh, personnel? I'm not certain. I believe so. But again, as part of the follow-up on the Lookout Inn, uh, we can certainly include that. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. You're welcome. Stu Neepy, The Guardian. Hi. Good afternoon to you both. Hi, Stu. Uh, question about, um, I understand that the New Brunswick government uh, was recently told that uh, their help in processing lab testing results would no longer be needed by the uh, Department of Health. So i um, wondering if the Nova Scotia government uh, has also been told uh, the same thing, and why is it that uh, testing results help is no longer needed from labs uh, in New Brunswick and, and possibly Nova Scotia? Actually, well, our lab tests are being conducted in uh, Nova Scotia um, on a daily basis, the ones that are not being done here locally. So I believe um, my my understanding would be that because Halifax and the QE2 is able to provide that uh, assistance at this point in time uh, and uh, is um, 
being able to do so um, on, a, on a regular basis, uh, then uh, we have not uh, needed to rely on uh, the Moncton or the New Brunswick uh, lab facility. And so it's, um, if one place has the capacity, and, and New Brunswick certainly has expanded a lot of testing um, themselves, and uh, so I think that may be uh, the answer you're looking for. Gotcha. Okay. okay. And, and just as a follow-up to that, uh, Dr. Morrison, I think about two weeks ago, uh, you'd mentioned that the goal was within a week to two weeks that the majority or all of uh, PEI testing would be able to be done locally. So how many how many tests uh, how many tests per day, I guess, like are, are be done being done from Nova Scotia, and how many are being conducted, you know, in PEI at this time? Okay. So, and uh, certainly I know, I think I said a couple of weeks ago that we'd expect every, every three to seven days to be doubling our capacity for testing here in Prince Edward Island um, with the ultimate goal of uh, certainly doing localized testing. So we are still moving uh, in, in that direction. But uh, I would say the, still the majority of tests are being done in Halifax, um, but we have our very rapid tests here of sort of under an hour, approximately an hour, when we need to do it, uh, do so here. It's uh, we've been using the local tests for a variety of situations, and um, we're getting more test uh, kits in for the machines that are um, coming in. And um, I'm meeting with our medical microbiologist uh, later this afternoon to discuss uh, the ongoing plans around testing. And um, of course, we want to keep so many test kits available in case of, of any potential outbreak. Um, in long-term care and uh, because we'll need to do those very quickly. So the uh, discussion's ongoing, but uh, certainly uh, the plan is to still um, increase that capacity uh, here locally, uh, Stu. For uh, daily or, or weekly capacity for analyzing test results? Uh, sorry, they, are there um, daily or weekly capacity? Yes. So... Um, We've certainly not uh, reached uh, our capacity on uh, our daily or weekly capacity at this point in time. And um, again, we'll, uh, we can uh, update you on that uh, in, in the days ahead, Stu, uh, um, based on uh, the new capacity that we're getting in here. And I think that has changed uh, on a daily basis. Uh, Ten days ago, we were able to do sort of 50 tests locally, and now close to 200 uh, locally. And again, that's uh, continuing to increase. But we'll be able to update you on those numbers uh, in the next couple of days. Okay, thank Major you. Major Collier, the Eastern Graphics. Hello. Um, I have a question for Dr. Morrison today. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering, given modeling information released yesterday, can you speak at all to what impact opening the spring lobster season might have on the health and safety of islanders. And maybe you could give some advice about what mild control measures versus strong control measures might look like for lobster fishers on the boats or processors working in plants. So, so a great question. Um, and I know I've received a number of emails uh, and so have m many people um, in various parts of government about uh, the lobster fishing season. And, um, my understanding is that there's still discussion um, about the lobster uh, fishing season. Um, we are working both on guidance for um, seafood processing plants as well as guidance for people who will maybe on not just lobster boats but on other kinds of fishing vessels um, to help minimize the risk to uh, fishers. And uh, I... Of course, I'm concerned about um, any time that we are not able to practice social or physical distancing well, which I know is the risk with on the wharf and on the boat. Um, but that needs to, you know, we try to manage uh, just like in, in other uh, facilities, uh, how do you try to get the what needs work done and uh, try to keep everyone safe. So. The answer is I think it's still part of a discussion and uh, we are trying to look at not only what other provinces are doing, um, 
in terms of Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, um, but trying to make sure we can give uh, the best advice here, knowing that there are discussions among the fish, amongst the fishers as well as with other parts of government. Okay, so speaking strictly from like a medical sp perspective, um, what kind of advice would you be contributing to that conversation, I guess? Well, as a public health uh, um, advice, I mean, we would be giving similar advice um, and input that we would into um, many other aspects of, uh, of businesses and schools that uh, we have been doing. So um, I think um, really the, the range of some of that advice has um, been really highlighted in the last month and uh, we'll continue uh, to participate uh, in um, inputting in with that uh, advice from a um, uh, medical point of view. Okay. Um, just Gary Wynn, Ocean 100. Hi, I guess my first question is for um, Marion Dowling. Um, Marion, you mentioned um, eventually, you know, you're look, starting to look at how uh, maybe essential services might be reinstated uh, down the road at some point, uh, certainly not tomorrow or maybe next week, but what would that look like as to, you know, what services would come back, uh, would come back first? Uh, hi, Carrie Wynn. I think it really depends on what the situation is, and we'll be working with uh, Dr. Morrison and her team on what makes sense, as well as really looking at what we have delayed to this point in time or suspended with respect to those services. So as we run essential services, part of our process is to evaluate continually those three-week basis of are there individuals there who've had their service delayed that now need, cannot delay any longer or it would um, not be safe for them to do so. So they need to come in and, and continue to have some access to some of those services. But it's really all of our areas have moved to that essential services plan. So they all need to move forward together as well. So if there is a surgical procedure, for example, which would then require um, primary care follow-up, laboratory pre surgery uh, testing, diagnostic imaging, pre-surgery testing, what are those things that uh, those folks have done? On top of which we need to consider the wait lists that we have and had pre-existing on PEI for some of our services. So how do we manage those individuals on those lists with the clinicians who are responsible for those uh, patients and their care and making sure that they're prioritized appropriately for the reinstatement of those services. So that's kind of the, the broad picture of how we need to look at moving that forward based on what we have suspended so far in the last four weeks, then in moving forward, if we were to reintroduce some of those services, how do they impact the essential services model for home care or, or those other kind of uh, areas? And what impact would that have if we are still um, in a state of needing to comply with the public health measures to protect in general the population and in particular our long-term care homes when we know how vulnerable they can be. Thank you. Um, Dr. Morrison, my next question is for you. Um, so we have 26 cases that have been positive, 23 of them recovered. Can you just clarify for us how it's determined if somebody is recovered and are they actually retested again to make sure that uh, they are negative? Uh, yes, so Carrie Wynn, uh, we, um, if someone's, uh, cons someone is considered recovered, if they have mild illness and uh, after 14 days they feel well, um, it's actually a little bit longer than some provinces. Some provinces have used 10 days. We use 14 days for mild illness and if they feel well and, have, and their symptoms are resolving. Uh, if you're a healthcare worker, you would have two tests 24 hours apart that need to be negative before you're able to go back to work. Work. And the other time that people would be retested um, are if uh, you've been hospitalized, so more severe illness um, or complications of COVID, um, then you uh, would also uh, uh, get uh, tested uh, to make sure that you're negative. 
And, and that's based on national guidance and uh, on the science, yes. Laurent Lavoie. Thank you. Bonjour, Dr. Morrison. Um, J'avais une question, vous, vous y avez répondu en anglais, mais j'aurais aimé avoir votre réponse en français. Est-ce qu'on peut tester tous les gens qui arrivent à l'île du Prince-Édouard par le pont ou par le ferry en mai Est-ce que ça aurait une utilité de tester euh, tous les gens qui débarquent à l'île OK, merci Laurent euh, pour la question. Parce que c'est une question qu'on reçoit euh, même par email des fois des gens. Euh, si on fait les tests, il y a euh, au moins 40-50 euh, s'il n'y en a pas des symptômes, que c'est comme un euh, euh, faux négatif. Alors, ce n'est pas un vrai négatif. Um, et peut-être ça va donner un peu de confiance à quelqu'un pour dire, oh, je n'ai pas le COVID, je ne veux pas auto-isoler. Sauf que c'est peut-être plusieurs jours après qu'il a des symptômes. Alors, les tests euh, euh, sont plus euh, sensibles, pour, sensitifs euh, si vous avez des symptômes. Um, alors, c'est pourquoi on ne peut pas juste aller faire les tests pour tout le monde. Mais, euh, en, en, mais pour les gens qui sont les contacts des, euh, des cas, on va en faire euh, pour être certain qu'ils sont négatifs. Et puis, on, ils vont les, les contacts des cas seront auto-isolés quand même. Um, on va s'organiser aussi pour faire les tests pour les euh, gens euh, dans les résidences euh, de long-term care qui ont... Euh, Peut-être s'il y en a un cas, on va faire les tests, euh, euh, un montant de tests pour les autres gens et les, euh, les travailleurs aussi, les infirmières pour euh, comme instant. Euh, alors, on, on fait des tests des fois avec les gens qui sont des contacts, des cas euh, sans symptômes, mais la plupart du temps, c est, c est, euh, euh, on ne doit pas faire les tests si quelqu'un n'a pas les symptômes. Um, et c'est à cause de la test, la euh, le sensibilité de les tests, vraiment. Um, et, go ahead. Juste par rapport aux tests, euh, euh, par rapport à la capacité de test euh, à Lille, est-ce que euh, s'il y a un cas positif qui est détecté à Lille, est-ce que vous allez euh, communiquer euh, sur ce cas en disant que c'est un cas probable avant que ce soit confirmé à Winnipeg ou est-ce que ce sera tout de suite un cas confirmé? Um, je, on va commencer um, le, um, le, de, on va annoncer le cas quand même euh, et um, ça va être confirmé um, à, à Winnipeg, mais um, on ne change pas la, la décision de, de chercher les contacts et de parler du cas ici. Um, merci. Uh, just uh, for those who um, were wondering what the question was in French, it was actually, I was just responding to the first question that I've already responded to in English. So just repeating that answer in French. And um, uh, the second question was about uh, if a test uh, is tested locally and is positive, um, it may be confirmed uh, off island, but we, w we would not wait to announce that case and we would not wait to follow up on, uh, with that case and initiate the contact tracing immediately. François, Radio-Canada. Bonjour, Dr. Morrison. Euh, quand on parle des, des proches de, du 26e cas que vous annoncez aujourd'hui, on parle de combien de personnes qui vont devoir être testées et si euh, elles sont positives, est-ce qu'on peut parler à ce moment-là de contagion communautaire? Oui, euh, je pense que c'est les trois contacts à ce moment euh, qui vont euh, être testés euh, et le... Um, et la deuxième partie de la question, est, je ne pense pas à ce moment, um, mais je sais que les infirmières de santé publique sont en train d'avoir les discussions avec uh, la famille. Uh, Aujourd'hui, uh, um, uh, ils ont commencé à en parler à peu près midi. Alors, on va savoir un peu plus uh, um, uh, par demain. Mais 
si ces personnes-là sont testées positives aussi, est-ce qu'on parle à ce moment-là de contagion communautaire ou si euh, ce sont des cas, des cas séparés? C'est des cas euh, carreliers ou un contact euh, de un cas international, c'est sauf euh, s'ils sont en, les, euh, ces contacts ont au on a eu beaucoup d'autres contacts. Ça, c'est où on parle de la, la communauté, euh, la euh, transmission communautaire. Mais à ce moment, s'ils sont positifs, ils sont euh, vraiment juste reliés au contact, au euh, cas euh, avec euh, les voyages euh, euh, internationaux. Une dernière question, si je peux me permettre. Vous avez mentionné en anglais que les tests, il y a une majorité de tests maintenant qui sont analysés au euh, euh, QE2 à Halifax. Oui. Est-ce que ça veut dire que l'île n'envoie plus beaucoup de tests à Winnipeg pour, euh, pour faire des analyses? Euh, oui, c'est... Euh, je sais qu'ils ont... Euh, euh, ils peuvent nous aider, euh, mais c'est un peu peu euh, plus euh, facile euh, d'envoyer les tests à Halifax. Um, et puis, à Halifax a maintenant augmenté leur capacité, alors ils peuvent nous aider à ce moment. Mais si on a besoin, on peut les envoyer encore euh, à Winnipeg. Merci. OK, merci beaucoup. OK, thank you very much. Thank you.